Hello, my name is Dr. Salvatore Dosmo, Assistant Professor of Surgery, Stony Brook Medicine. Today we're going to be talking about peroral pyloromyotomy or gastroparesis. The typical gastroparesis patient will often present with complaints of bloating, nausea, and vomiting. Many times, they present to my office with a previous workup which often includes EGD, a gastric emptying study, pH manometry, or CAT scan. These many studies indicate that many times these patients are bounced around from medical specialty to medical specialty because their diagnosis is unknown. Typically, from my standpoint, they do present with a already known diagnosis of gastroparesis, either from a primary care doctor or from a gastroenterologist. Many times they've already failed, tried and failed uh, medication uses such as Reglan and erythromycin. They often have a history of diabetes, surgery, as well as a long-term use of psychiatric medications. And typically, these patients will also present with a history of weight loss as well. In this particular case, we present a 61-year-old male who presented with complaints of bloating, nausea, and vomiting. He also had a previous gastric emptying study, which demonstrated 45% activity at four hours. He tried previous medical therapy, which included Reglan, with no success. And most significantly, he also had a 60-pound weight loss over the past three years, an average of four-point gastroparesis cardinal index score. Typical etiologies of gastroparesis include idiopathic gastroparesis, diabetic gastroparesis, as well as post-surgical patients contribute as a remaining portion. Surgery such as fundoplication following a hydrohernia repair can present with a postoperative complication of gastroparesis. Women are also four times more likely to present with gastroparesis compared to men, as demonstrated by a previous population study, which demonstrated an incidence of 9.8 per 100,000 for women compared to 2.4 per 100,000 for men. The reasons for this remain unknown. Currently, two studies are used to diagnose gastroparesis, a gastric emptying study and a wireless motility capsule. A gastric emptying study typically requires the patient to eat a small amount of food, typically of eggs and toast, which contains a small amount of radioactive material. A scanner then detects the movement of the radioactive material out of the stomach. The monitor calculates the rate at which the food leaves your stomach and a percentage can then be calculated. We can diagnose gastroparesis by what percentage of food remains in the stomach, typically at the end of the four hours. A 35% typically demonstrates severe gastric emptying. A wireless motility capsule can also be used, but a gastric emptying time greater than four hours signifying a diagnosis of gastroparesis. The gastroparesis cardinal symptom index is a well-documented and peer-reviewed scale I typically use in my own practice to evaluate the severity of the patient's gastroparesis. However, it is more useful to track whether or not treatment is working. And if you ever read any studies regarding gastroparesis, you would typically see references to the pre and post gastroparesis cardinal symptom index scores. In regards to medical therapy, metoclopramide or Reglan is the only FDA approved drug for gastroparesis. However, the complications of tardive dyskinesia has resulted in many patients refusing to be on this medication long term. Erythromycin is another option, uh, which is a macrolide antibiotic. It acts on the, uh, on the agonist of the motilin receptor. Uh, but again, long term usage of these medications is not ideal for motilin. In addition to medical treatments, we also have lifestyle modification options. These often include smaller, more frequent meals, also supplementation with liquid protein. Surgical options include uh, gastric electrical stimulators, gastrectomies, pyloroplasty. In terms of the gastric electrical stimulator, the one produced often most commonly used is by the uh, Entera uh, therapy system by Medtronic, which delivers a high-frequency, low-energy stimuli to the, uh, to the stomach in order to uh, ensure motility. Other option, again, that you have is pyloroplasty. Uh, this includes a longitudinal division of the full thickness of the pyloric ring, and it's usually, or should be closed by transverse closure, full thickness, in order to assure an open lumen. Other option you do have is also a pyloromyotomy, 
which involves the longitudinal division of uh, serosa, muscular layers of the distal stomach and pylorus, and also uh, it's extended onto the proximal duodenal bulb. And in this situation, you do leave the uh, mucosa intact. Other surgical option you have is also a full gastrectomy. Now, when the surgical options have failed, other options you also have are obviously endoscopic options, one of them, be, one of them being Botox injections. The problem with Botox injection is it does not have a long-lasting effect. Other option is there is some concern in terms of the development of scar tissue. So if you are going to proceed forward with a, uh, with a POP procedure, you might encounter uh, scar tissue, which can hinder your procedure. Other options include a decompressive peg, but again, these have a high morbidity and really does not solve the problem of your nutrition. And in most cases, if you do place a peg, you also need to include a feeding duodenostomy tube as well, which also has its own uh, morbidity as well. And then finally, our uh, one uh, last option that we're going to focus on for the rest of the talk is the pleural pyloromyotomy. Per oral pyloromyotomy or POP begins by injecting a mixture of saline and methylene blue into the submucosal space approximately 3 to 5 centimeters proximal to the pylorus. A 1.5 centimeter transverse incision into the mucosa is made using cutting energy to allow the scope and cap to enter the submucosal space. The submucosal tunnel is then extended toward the pylorus. The pylorus is then cut using coagulation. The mucosotomy is then closed using Boston Scientific Resolution 360 clips in a transverse fashion. The following is a list of what I typically use for a pop a GIF H190 scope, a silicon-based endoscopic cap, and also carbon dioxide for insulin that is more rapidly absorbed compared to air. An Irby electrosurgical unit, a hybrid knife, injection solution, which consists of methylene blue mixed in 500 cc of saline, 80 milligrams of gentamicin and one liter of saline, and Boston Scientific Resolution Clips. I use a lesser curve approach compared to the greater curve approach. I start approximately 3 to 5 centimeters proximal to the pylorus on the lesser curve. I found two significant advantages to this approach. One, shorter submucosal tunnel, and two, easier closure of the mucosotomy. Difficulty is noted in passing the scope to the pylorus. The stomach is then irrigated with the gentamicin rinse. We start the procedure by creating a submucosal space. This is created by injecting our mixture of saline and methylene blue beneath the mucosa. Our initial in injection is usually approximately three to five centimeters proximal from the pylorus. Using cut energy, a 1.5 centimeter transverse cut is then made through the mucosa into the submucosal plane. The two most commonly used settings on our device is the Irby EndoCut Q Effect 2 for cutting and spray coag effect 2 at 50 watts for coagulation. Again, the device that I use is a Irby hybrid knife. Again, you can utilize the, the cap on the end of the scope to push down that bottom leaflet of, your, of the mucosa, and then with forward and downward traction and movement, you should be able to enter into the submucosal space.
Here you can see the dark blue area below the white pyloric muscle. That is the area that you want to continuously inject and cut in order to develop your submucosal tunnel. CO2 gas is used throughout the entirety of the procedure. And again, this is to prevent respiratory effects of the pneumoper of, uh, pneumoperitoneum, which can occur if, the, if a full thickness tissue division is made during the procedure or if the procedure itself becomes fairly long. And again, the reason why is because CO2 is more rapidly absorbed compared to air. Obviously, exohemostasis during the procedure is of significant importance. And as you progress through your dissection, you will encounter some bleeding at times. We will commonly inject and fill up the entire cap with fluid, which helps us visualize the vessels more easily. And again, uh, we continuously inject below the white pyloric muscle. And this is also the area that we will continuously cut and coag in order to develop our submucosal tunnel. As your submucosal begins to uh, develop, care must be taken not to damage the underlying mucosa because at this point you will enter into the duodenum. The best way to keep the mucosa down away from the pylorus in, in order to optimize your dissection is to have a continuous forward motion on your cap, continuous CO2 uh, insufflation as well. When we move forward with the procedure and start to cut the pylorus, I will use uh, coag, the coag setting and in most instances, we will use a distal to proximal motion in which we place the hybrid knife tip beyond the edge of pylorus, deflect upward, and then slowly pull the knife back in order to hook the muscle, and then cut. In many instances as well, this, the pylorus is under significant tension, and you can also simply split the muscle by placing the hybrid knife just above the layer of the muscle and then firing. This will create an arc of energy uh, that will cut the muscle. The question always arises, what, how much do you cut? And from my experience thus far, you want to continue to cut the pylorus until you see the underlying mucosa. In the majority of instances, you will start to see a light blue mucosa underneath where the pylorus muscle originally was. This is where you should stop your cutting. However, throughout the case, I will also intermittently 
remove the scope and go back through the pylorus in order to see if the original significant amount of tension is still present. If it's present, I will go back and continue the pyloromyotomy. Compared to when we first visualized the pylorus, the amount of resistance is significantly less. In order to close the mucosotomy, I utilize Boston Scientific Resolution 360 clips. Most commonly, closure usually requires approximately four to six clips. And I will always place one clip be just beyond one of the far edges of the mucosotomy, which then creates two ridges above and below that allows for easy placement of the additional clips. Other option for closures that you do have includes an overstitch device. But in my current practice, I've only needed to use through the scope clips. POP is a safe procedure. A recent publication evaluated 54 patients who underwent POP who were discharged home on the same day as the procedure. These patients were compared to 54 patients who were admitted following the procedure. They found no significant difference between readmission rates and complications. Expectantly, total costs for the same day discharge patients were less. POP is not only safe, it is effective as well. A publication with one of the largest sample sizes in the literature found the 4-hour retention rate on gastric emptying studies were 17.9%, down from 464 following POP. Also, a normal gastric emptying study was noted in 50% of the test subjects on follow-up imaging. 